morning again, church. Um, I already gave the high school kids the Christmas lesson, so I'm not going to do that to them again, but I did give you Christmas colors in the PowerPoint, so that'll have to be enough. I've made this joke before, and I'll probably keep making it until it gets old. I was a drug dealer. And by that, I mean that I delivered for the pharmacy in Paul's Valley to old people and nursing homes in town. And uh, one time, there was this guy uh, that I used to deliver to all the time. He was an old man, one of those situations where he couldn't get down to the pharmacy to get his stuff. And so at least once a week or once every other week, as I was going about my rounds, uh, delivering and doing all those things, I would, I would see him a lot. He would never want to pay for his stuff. He, he, was, he was always not excited for me to come around, really, it seemed. But eventually he would give in, and I would say, it's, it's got to be this much. This is what they told me. I'm, I'm just the delivery guy. You can call them about this. I can't, I can't do anything else for you, pal. And I'd have that interaction with this guy a lot. It would always go very similarly, very often the same thing. After a while, I noticed that I hadn't been there on my regular routes. I would go into, the, go into the pharmacy, get my stuff in a bucket, all my deliveries, and I would go out in my little pink Chevy Spark that we called the gumball and go do my things. But after a few weeks, I realized that I hadn't seen this guy in a while. Didn't have this de delivery anymore. started kind of missing him. It was a rough interaction, but I didn't get to see him anymore. I asked the people that I worked for, the, the people that ran the pharmacy, what happened? Do you know, where, where is this guy? Why, why am I not going out to him anymore? Where has he been? He passed away. He was gone. I missed him. This grumpy old man whom I had always had a pretty rough interaction with. I came to realize over time that I was probably the only interaction that that guy had. And though we had our squabbles, me the delivery boy, and him the guy who needed drugs, I realized that I was probably the only person that this guy living all alone by himself ever saw. That was probably the only interaction that he had had. I thought back to all of those times, and this is still a rough thought for me. I was the only neighbor that this man had. The only interaction with another person. And what did I do with it? Was I a neighbor to this man? This is what we're going to be talking about uh, this morning. We'll be in Luke chapter 10, and we'll read through verses 25 uh, through 37 here in a minute. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think this one is especially important in our world today, in the lives that we're living, in the circumstance uh, that we have in our place in time. A man comes to Jesus with a question. And he gives, a, he gives the man an answer uh, that I think is still pertinent to, pertinent to us today. Ooh, let's see if I can work a clicker. Ooh, there we go. All right. Let's start with verse 25. And I'll be reading from the ESV this morning, Luke chapter 10. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do? To inherit eternal life. That's kind of a big question, right? To give some context uh, to this, we don't necessarily know where this lawyer comes from, uh, what he's doing up until here. He sort of just appears in the narrative. The story is almost written as an interrupt in what's going on. It's kind of odd how it's placed in the text here, it's different. But upon a sudden, there's no as they were going or 
when he was traveling this way or that way, as there is oftentimes in stories of Jesus, and especially in Luke, who's, who's telling it and trying to be very particular and detailed as he's writing for someone else. It just says, and behold, a lawyer appears, and he has a question. And this is something that's not too strange in Jesus' ministry. This is something that, that happens quite a bit. People will come up to Jesus. And maybe they're trying to trick him or get him to say something that he shouldn't say, to do something out of line, to be able to convict him of something. The more I study this, the more I think that this lawyer's intentions are just a little bit more innocent than that. He comes up to Jesus and he asks him, what should I do to inherit eternal life? He's heard about this Jesus guy. This is right after Jesus has sent out the 72. He's been building up his movement up to this point. People know about him. People have heard about him. There's good news going about everywhere. The stories of the healings and the hope, the life that this guy is bringing to people. The knowledge that he has. The things that he's saying, that he's teaching, it's all radical and new and different. People are excited about it. And so this lawyer, this guy who's devoted his life to studying the law, he comes up to Jesus and he asks him, what do I need to do for eternal life? This mortal stuff, it isn't cutting it. What do I do to do this right? To keep on living. How do I get that? Oop, there we go. And here's how Jesus answers. At least to start. He says, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. That's it. Jesus doesn't even really answer him. He gets him to answer his own question. It's kind of funny how Jesus can turn things so easily sometimes. He's a clever guy, I think. Maybe even a little bit funny. This man knows the law. He knows the answers. He wasn't asking Jesus so that Jesus would give him the scripture. I think Jesus knows this as well. The man comes to him looking for something new, for something different. Jesus gives him kind of a simple answer here to start. You know the law. Do this and you'll live. That's it. Love God with everything that you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. And these are two different passages. The Shema, it's earlier. This is uh, on which all scripture hinges. That this is the point of it all. This is what we're working for. If you want eternal life, live for the one who's eternal with everything that you have. And live, live for the him that you see in other people. As an image of the creator is in all of us. That's it. Simple as that. But that wasn't enough. It's not what the lawyer came for. He wasn't going to be satisfied with just that. And so it, he continues on here. Uh, and it says, but uh, he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I think the wording there is interesting, desiring to justify himself. What's he looking for? What does that mean that he's desiring to justify himself, justify or, or to make right, to become righteous maybe? What does he need? Is he trying to prove himself in front of this guy who's building up this movement as someone who is a part of maybe some sort of old guard the people that other people used to look to, but now they're looking to this other guy. Is he trying to prove himself? Or maybe he knows, maybe deep down, maybe not so much outwardly, 
that somewhere along the way he might have missed it. That he needs to know more. Words from those old pages haven't gotten him to the place where he needs it. And this guy seems to have figured it out. So what does it mean, Jesus? And then we get this story, this parable, the Good Samaritan. And Jesus gives a bit of a longer answer to the second question. It says, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Not so simple uh, of an answer as was to the first question. Jesus perceiving what's going on in this man what he's really asking. There's a lot going on in this story. Uh, A lot of important points here. This road from Jerusalem to Jericho, a treacherous one, a common trade route that many would have gone by if they're going to do business. But the robbers know this as well. So very often along this road where there are rocks and things to hide behind, that kind of place, Or you can get away with this kind of thing. They find a man, beat him within an inch of his life, and take everything that he's got. Losing my microphone. This is a thing that, that, that wouldn't have been too uncommon in the time and at that place. And as they're going, some priests come by. And this man, I believe we may... Uh, be able to assume that he was a Jew, but if not, the story has the same significance. Some priests going to the temple, they come by and they see him. This is the part where I would ask the kids, and what do they do? The priest goes by on the other side, on the other side of the road, maybe as though he didn't see him, maybe as though he did. But he's got to get to the temple. This is one man. He's did whatever he did to get him into this place. That's none of my business. I've got to get to the temple. I've got more important places to be. And a Levite, a member of the priestly tribe, the leaders, high and righteous people, who are always portrayed that way throughout scripture, he'll stop, right? Of course. But he does the same thing. Goes along on the other side, the exact same words there. But but a Samaritan. The language there showing a big turn in the story. This is the focal point, but a Samaritan. Samaritans being uh, people that were despised by the Jews. They're of the wrong bloodline without going too deep into the history. They didn't care for them. They had their own place in uh, the land that, that they would often, when traveling, go all the way around just to not have to deal with any Samaritans. These were not people held in high regard. In fact, they were probably some of the least popular people. Why should he stop? 
but he does. He picks the man up, puts him on his animal, probably a donkey, something, maybe a camel. We've got animal in the ESV, however you want to look at that. Takes him to an inn, and he takes care of him. Does everything that he can for this man. Says to the innkeeper, watch over him, and if you spend any more, I'll be back and I'll repay you, I promise. He gives everything and then some. For this man he's never met. A stranger who under uh, different circumstances would likely despise him, look down on him, see him as nothing more than trouble. Regardless, he cares for him. What does that sound like? I feel like we've talked about something like that not too long ago. And so to answer the lawyer's question after all of this, after this story, he says, which which one of them was a neighbor to the man? And the answer is significant as well. The one who showed him mercy. But I think it's important for us to see uh, what the man is not saying. He doesn't say the Samaritan. For this lawyer, this man looked up to by the Jews who's high in society. He's still having a tough time with this lesson. He can't. He can't even bring himself to say the name, the word. And the Samaritan was the neighbor. The one who had mercy. And there's an understanding in that as well. The significance of this story. What, what's important as we bring this all together. What Jesus needs the man to see is that he was uh, looking for who my neighbor is supposed to be. He's asking the wrong question is the point of this. He's missed it. And just as he comes to Jesus, uh, as we speculate, maybe knowing that he's been missing something about all of this this whole time, here's what he's missed. You've been looking all your life for the person who you, your neighbor is supposed to be. Who am I to be a neighbor to? Instead of how can I be a neighbor myself? It's not about them, their circumstance, where they've come from. It's about me. How can I show mercy? How can I be a neighbor in this situation? See, this is the easy thing to do. It's so much easier to ask who my neighbor is, to draw those lines, say, this is where everyone stands in my life. What's not easy is to say, I will love and show grace and mercy regardless where anyone in my life may stand. I think this is important, especially in our world today. Everything, every new thing that pops up in our world, every new bit of news seems to be more and more polarizing and on purpose. Pushing us farther and farther to whatever side we may cling to. Every day it feels like there's another line drawn in the, the proverbial sand. More, if you need to be baptized, would you come forward now as we stand and as we sing?